Subacromial pain syndrome is a common condition we see in clinical practice. But how do you diagnose it properly? What's the clinical reasoning behind your diagnosis? How can you differentiate it from other clinical conditions? Let's dive into all of this in this video. So let's look at this case study. A 48-year-old office worker comes in complaining of pain when reaching overhead and difficulty putting on his shirt. He says it started gradually over three months, no trauma, and it's worst when reaching behind or lifting a bag. So here we are looking at a SOAP format, which is Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. And under the subjective part, we're looking at the history taking here, some basic questions like onset, which is gradual, as we saw earlier, there was no particular mechanism of injury. We need to understand the pain intensity and pain type. So the pain intensity here was about 6 out of 10 on the numerical pain rating scale. The pain type was an ache and sharp during movement. To exclude any neurological involvement, we ask for if the, if the patient has any pins and needles or numbness or radiating pain, which he didn't have. So that was excluded from the subjective, but we still have to look at some objective testing for that. Aggravating symptoms that made his pain worse were overhead movements and reaching behind. Some of the things that made his pain feel better was uh, resting it, obviously avoiding movement and putting on a, a heat bag or a hot water bag. He did have pain at night, especially on lying on the affected shoulder. And his occupation was mainly a desk-based job that he's been doing for a couple of years and had poor posture and no, no proper ergonomic support. The client wasn't having any regular pain medications or any other medications. He had no imaging, that is, x-ray, ultrasound or MRI performed for his shoulder previously. Past medical history was clear. His activity levels included daily walks for 30 minutes and no strength training. Social history was he was mainly an office-based work, worker and used to spend most of the time at home. There were no previous injuries around the shoulder, but he did mention about an uh, injury that is he had low back pain uh, two, two years ago but nothing around the shoulder. Red flags and yellow flags were excluded. Um, to know more about the red flags and the yellow flags, I'll make a separate video on that. Now let's move on to the second part of our SOAP assessment, that is the objective examination. Starting with observation, the patient had slightly rounded shoulders. There was scapula winging and protraction, but there was no swelling around the shoulder. The next few important things to look at are active range of motion, passive range of motion, and manual muscle testing. So in active range of motion, the patient, while performing flexion, had pain in the 100 to 120 degrees range. While doing abduction, we can notice the painful arc sign, which is nothing but pain in 60 to 120 degrees of abduction. In external rotation, he had pain in the end range, in internal rotation, there was pain while reaching behind the back. Now looking at the passive range of motion for the flexion and abduction, uh, there was full range except for pain while reaching the end range. Even external rotation and internal rotation in supine while testing the passive range of motion was painful in the end ranges, but not restricted. On manual muscle testing for flexion and abduction, it was pain limited. So instead of true weakness, we could see that the patient was in pain and because of that, it was limited. So it was pain limited uh, weakness that we can observe in the flexion and abduction. In external rotation, there was definitely mild weakness and internal rotation was preserved, but it was painful while doing the manual muscle testing. On palpation, there was tenderness over the supraspinatus insertion region and the subacromial region, but there was no tenderness over the acromioclavicular joint region. So for the special tests, as you know, there are a lot of special tests for the shoulder, but we select just a few that seem to be relevant according to our subjective and objective findings so far. So here we need to see whether there is, of course, a 
subacromial pain syndrome that's going on here and also to see if the rotator cuff tendons are intact. So according to that, we will select some test that is the nearest test, which again was positive. Here is a picture of the nearest test. It is to see if there is any subacromial pain syndrome or impingement. Hawkins Kennedy test, again, the one here that turned out to be positive, again, uh, indicating sub subacromial pain syndrome. The empty can test, which is to check the structural integrity of the supraspinatus tendon. It was again painful and there was mild weakness right here. Here's a picture of the empty can test. And then we have the drop arm test, which is more of a test to see whether there is a full thickness tear of the rotator cuff tendon. But that was negative, so we could understand that there was no complete tear. Now the spurling test is nothing but to confirm if the pain is not originating from the cervical spine. So that again was negative. So we could come to a conclusion that it was subacromial pain syndrome from the special test. But we need to now integrate all of these findings together and come to a final diagnosis. Now let's clinically reason this. So one of the first points was there was no trauma. So there's less chances of a tear. Painful arc sign was positive and there were also other impingement signs which points to subacromial impingement or subacromial pain syndrome. There was mild weakness and a chronic nature that is the pain was ongoing for a couple of um, for, for a while now. So it points to supraspinatus tendinopathy which is why when we were doing the empty can tests it turned out positive. So here, along with SAPS, that's the sub subacromial pain syndrome, there's also a supraspinatus tendinopathy component as well. Now, if you ask me why it's not a rotator cuff tear, it's not that the patient cannot lift things. He can still lift it, but there was still pain. So that should be one of our thoughts. Why is it not a frozen shoulder? So again, uh, he has full passive range of motion, whereas in frozen shoulder, you'll see that the uh, passive range of motion is restricted. If you look at other things like, why isn't it a biceps tendinopathy? So in biceps tendinopathy, you'll have uh, some subjective findings like pain in the front of the shoulder and pain aggravated by things that involve elbow flexion. He can have like clicking if there's a slap lesion associated with it. And also, why is it not um, a calcific tendinitis? So again, in calcific tendinitis, there will be severe shoulder pain that can be there even at rest, like and at night, and there can be a hard lump on palpation. So these are some of the signs narrowed down to subacromial pain syndrome and not other several conditions. So there's a lot of possibilities and things. It's more like a maths equation. You need to find the different findings, make it together, give your proper clinical reasoning to come to a proper diagnosis. With time and experience, this does get better. And I hope this video helped all of you to get to a proper understanding of how to come to a diagnosis. So here the final diagnosis will be subacromial pain syndrome and stage 1 supraspinatus tendinopathy. Now for the management, first thing is we need to advise the patient to do some activity modifications to avoid overhead stress and in the meantime we will be giving the patient some scapular and rotator cuff strengthening exercises also postural correction and thoracic mobility exercises. And for manual therapy, there will be some posterior glides, inferior glides for the shoulder, and also some pec minor release and uh, pain management strategies that can be provided. Now, there'll be a, a detailed video for management of subacromial pain syndrome that will be coming soon. Just a final disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes only. It is simplified for new graduate clinicians and students. It is not a substitute for proper clinical diagnosis or treatment. If you or a client need diagnosis or care, you should see a qualified physiotherapist for a full individualized assessment.